So as Bob was kind enough to introduce me this morning, my name's Mark Crane. I'm a uh, partner here in the Toronto office working in the commercial litigation group and I'm the national lead of our arbitration group here in Canada. Um, I'm pleased to be moderating this panel on investment treaties uh, and, and we've got a terrific panel to, to, to canvas questions with for the next half hour or so. And so I'll waste no more time but to introduce my panel here. Um, immediately to my right is Wendy Wagner. Wendy is a partner in her Ottawa office where, she pra where her practice focuses on in part international trade law. Wendy's also the leader of the firm's privacy and data protection group. In her international trade practice, Wendy represents clients involving trade, investment agreements, export controls and sanctions and embargoes. She has appeared as counsel on trade-related matters before the Canadian International Trade Tribunal and the Federal Court of Canada, and she has litigated NAFTA-related disputes. Wendy's expertise in international trade has been recognized by Chambers and Best Lawyers and other organizations. To Wendy's right is uh, our colleague from London, England, Michael Dorowski. Michael is a partner in our London office where he practices in the area of international arbitration. And his focus is particularly within the energy, natural resources, financial, transportation, and telecom sectors. And Michael is an active member of, amongst other institutions, the London Court of International Arbitration as a member of the Young, arbitration, arbitration, uh, Young International Arbitration Group. And, and finally, but not least of which, is my colleague Paul Murphy. Paul is uh, a managing director in our firm's energy group and he is based out of Washington, D.C. Paul's practice focuses on multiple aspects of the nuclear industry, from legal and policy matters, including international regulatory tre treaty work, to strategies for creating viable nuclear power <coughs> programs. Paul represents developers, owners, investors, contractors on nuclear projects internationally. Paul's recognized as an expert in the development and financing of nuclear programs, by, amongst other organizations, the International Atomic Energy Agency and the United States government. Uh, prior to joining Gowling's WLG, Paul served as senior counsel for Bechtel Power Corporation, where he supported both the nuclear and fossil fuel business lines. And what I wanted to do prior to engaging the panel in questions was to just give a brief overview relating to investment treaties. And I've put up on the screen uh, a definition for bilateral investment treaties because it may be the, the one topic today that some people don't have a, a lot of back or context for. And so you can see the definition up on the screen. And, and, and bilateral investment treaties are particularly important for us in Canada uh, because given the resource based of our economy, we are extracting, given the presence of the TSX here in Toronto, we often have uh, corporations or investors that have a Canadian presence where they have assets abroad. And so bilateral investment treaties um, from the Canadian context allow and, and provide some comfort and to investors where they've got an investment in assets abroad. To give you some context for the number of bilateral investment treaties, there's, as you can see up on the screen, approximately 3,000 worldwide. In Canada, the number, we've just almost 40 bits that have been signed in Canada. And the vast majority of these have been entered into by governments uh, since 1990. And so why do you enter into these things? They provide some protection to investors going into the foreign country in the event their, for example, their, their asset is expropriated without compensation or if they've been some unfair trade practices and it provides some recourse to, to the investor going into the international uh, country. And, and why is this relevant to arbitration? Uh, it, it, in part because generally the, the bits of the bilateral investment treaties require disputes between contracting parties to, to resolve their disputes by way of arbitration as opposed to domestic or national courts. And so it elevates it in part for the reasons that we heard from from Gordon, that, that if you get an award, then you'll have an opportunity to go and enforce it more easily than you may otherwise have been able to in the domestic court. 
we've got a screen here of, of uh, the location uh, in those jurisdictions with whom Canada has entered into bilateral investment treaties. And I'll canvas through this relatively quickly. And then, and then a second visual of, of those jurisdictions uh, where Canada has entered into investment treaties that have some investment protections such as NAFTA up on the screen. And we'll, we'll get there when we turn to our panel. And with the growth of investment treaties, you recall there's 3,000 in present day, that has given rise to a similar growth in terms of the number of, in, of, of investor state arbitrations that have, that have arisen um, in recent years. And you can see the trend has, the top line being the number of investment treaties that have been entered into, and the red line reflecting the, the growth in the number of disputes that, that give rise, arising out of these investment treaties. And so with that context, what I thought I'd do is now canvas with our panel. Uh, I've given some context, um, Michael, about bilateral investment treaties, and they're there to protect investors who make investments in foreign jurisdictions. Can you give us some context as to what's considered to be an investment for the purposes of a treaty? Um, well, well, generally the, the treaty will have a definition of an investment in it. Those definitions tend to be pretty broad to capture as many types of assets as possible and tribunals in, in disputes arising under bilateral investment treaties have tended to construe the definitions pretty broadly as well. I think we've got a slide which has got a um, definition of an investment from one of Canada's uh, investment treaties with the Ivory Coast. So you can see from that that there's a, this covers a whole range of asset uh, categories, so we're talking about companies, we're talking about shares in companies, financial instruments and loans, real estate, um, it can be rights under a contract such as a concession contract, that sort of thing. So it, it, it's, it's very broad and covers a lot of things, um, uh, which means that investment treaties are important in a whole load of transactions. So for example, if you're doing an international M&A transaction, you may want to consider what bilateral investment treaty protections might be available, which impact on that transaction. Um, but one thing to mention is that investments tend to also, it, 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 there is a generally a requirement that the investment uh, shouldn't just be a passive holding. It does require some sort of active uh, performance of a project or, or use of the investment by the investor which contributes to the economic development of the host state in which the investment is made. And, and when you did anything to add there or has he covered the landscape? Yeah, I mean it's, it's broad enough so that for example it'll cover intangible property rights which is one of the categories that's listed on the slide. So for example in a case that we did um, for Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company, the investments at issue were the patents uh, two of the patents that were um, owned by the company in Canada. So that was actually what we had claimed was expropriated um, by the uh, action of the courts in Canada. So you can, and, and that's not, I mean, that's not a new thing by any means. Those intangible property rights have been protected for, you know, there's cases from the 1930s that, that acknowledge that. And then really, you know, one of the only things I can think of that's not commonly covered would be um, revenues flowing from a commercial contract. And I think, for example, in the uh, context of NAFTA, the definition of investment specifically mentions that that's a category that's excluded. So that's one of the things you can think of. It's not, not captured. And, and I think we've got a, a question at the back there. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real estate is yeah. tangible property. So, I mean, traditionally, and we'll get into this uh, more, but traditionally one of the most commonly, uh, or common types of claims that you see is for expropriation, which often will, a traditional expropriation claim will involve um, real property uh, frequently. So. And, and uh, you've mentioned, we've gone through definitions, you've mentioned expropriation. Apart from expropriation, which would be conduct that, that the treaties are trying to prevent or manage, what other behavior are the treaties trying to address, Wendy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you, you've seen from the first slide, that definition of bilateral investment treaty was one that we came up with ourselves because actually when we had looked up the definition online, it, in my view it wasn't very accurate because it had said the 
the terms and conditions for investment in the host state or something like that. It's really not, the treaties are not about terms and conditions, they're about obligations that are accepted by host governments um, towards foreign investors that in invest in the economy. So what a treaty will <clears throat> commonly do is you know, in the first part of the treaty, they'll set out what those specific obligations are, and then in the second part of the treaty, they'll set out your um, dispute uh, resolution mechanisms. So the obligations are the most common one that people would be familiar with is expropriation, um, which isn't just limited to uh, you know, an, an actual physical taking of property. Um, commonly, the cases will involve an indirect expropriation. So what you're complaining of is some form of government measure. So it'll be, it could be a law, a regulation, a policy, a practice, um, any, any measure undertaken by government. And, and, then, and then you see whether that measure offends one of those obligations. And so indirect expropriation would be you know, a regulation that has the effect of depriving the investor of substantially all of the value of the investment. So it's, all, it's tantamount or equivalent to a, a traditional physical taking, but it's, it's um, regulatory in nature. And then you have um, fair and equitable treatment or the minimum standard of treatment is another common obligation. It sets a fairly high standard. It um, requires the host state, for example, to have um, a system of, a functioning system of justice. It will require the, the host state pr to provide full protection and security to the investment. So you, know, you can't have armed insurgents walking in and taking the investment without the state having given some recourse or having taken some, some action to protect the investor. Um, it encompasses the, uh, the concept of legitimate expectations based on specific representations made to the investor. So that's kind of um, in, in that bucket. There's um, most favored nation treatment and national treatment. So that guards against um, discriminating between foreign investors either treating your own investors in a preferable way to a foreign investor or treating investors from other jurisdictions in a preferable way to um, investors from, from the, the jurisdiction that's uh, bringing the complaint. Um, there's performance requirements. So you think of a company going into or protections against certain performance requirements. So a company goes into a jurisdiction and um, they uh, are producing, invest in a plant to produce a certain type of product, and now the host government says, you must export 95% of what you produce, because we don't want your, your production to compete against production from the local economy, so you are required to export 95% of your um, production. That would be a performance requirement that might be prohibited um, by a specific treaty. So those are some of the more common ones. Um, I don't, I don't really have much to add in terms of the types of protection. I guess some, of, just thinking of some examples of what might might constitute expropriation, because it doesn't, it isn't always the the obvious sort of military walking into a mine and chucking the investor out of the country. country. That sort of that sometimes happens, but it's pretty rare because of the, the negative publicity that's associated with that. And you can expropriate someone pretty efficiently through through any number of uh, more subtle ways. Um, but uh, I've, I've for. To, to, to provide some examples, I, I've just finished a two-week um, hearing of an ICSID arbitration where we we're acting for a government uh, where the allegation is that there was a creeping expro expropriation by way of repeated tax audits of, the, of a company uh, uh, set up by the investor. Those tax audits led to a criminal investigation and various criminal charges bring br being brought with money uh, being in, in the accounts of the company being confiscated um, uh, as security for the potential um, uh, damages that, that, that the government would be able to claim um, as if, if they were able to prove that the tax um, charges were, 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 uh, were, were uh, properly brought. Um, and that is alleged to have led to the closure of the business because the business then couldn't pay its bills, it couldn't pay its ele electricity bills, it shut down. This is all, you know, I say this is all alleged, this is all yet to be det determined, but, uh, but those, that's the sort of conduct that gets, uh, get, gets um, treated as indirect expropriation. Looking at some examples of what Canadian companies have, uh, of disputes Canadian, involving Canadian companies, um, there's a big 
award recently given to Crystal X relating to Venezuela, it's got to, to gold deposits there, where it successfully argued that it was refused to be, it, it wasn't given an environmental permit to extract gold, uh, and the failure to give that environmental permit was, was an indirect expropriation. So in indirect expropriations, the assets that, that are the investment, the title to those assets, tends to remain with the investor, but effectively the benefit of those assets is, is, is removed from the investor, the economic benefits are lost. Um, so those are the sort of things you, you, you tend to see. Terrific. So, so we've heard uh, what a bid is, sort of what falls within the context of an investment, what behavior they're trying to uh, mitigate against or manage. Paul, can, can you give us your thoughts on when contracting parties ought to start thinking about investment treaties uh, in their negotiations? Sure. I think, you know, there's a tendency to sort of when you're in a, in a, a bad situation and you're preparing for claims, dispute resolution, you sit there and say, well, what's available to me? And you may look and say, well, is there a bit? Do I fall on, do I have anything I can turn to? But I think the, the more prudent approach is to be doing that at the deal formation stage so that you have these remedies available to you, these protections available to you before you even start the deal. And so I think, you know, at the deal formation stage, I, you know, you generally recommend if you're going into a foreign jurisdiction when you're negotiating your commercial deal, you don't want to be subject to the local law and you don't want to be subject to the local courts. I mean, that's sort of chapter and verse as to what not to do, you know, unless you're in certain sophisticated jurisdictions. And so, you know, if you start with that premise, what you'll find a lot of times is if it's a government type procurement, there may be national laws that basically say, thou shalt, you know, use local law and local courts and they can't contract around it unless there's some special exemption that's available. So you may not be able to negotiate your way out of those provisions. And so from a risk mitigation perspective, looking at whether or not there is a bit that may then l let you know that, hey, if, if I get railroaded in, in the local courts, then I can, I, I have somewhere else to go, some other forum to protect my interests. And then you start to get into, well, what if I'm in a country or I'm coming from a country where there is no bit with this jurisdiction? What can I do? And that starts getting you into, well, can I, can I structure my deal so that I run it through an intermediate country that may have a bit? So, for example, the Netherlands is one country that has a ton of bits. And so you may say, well, maybe we can form a Dutch company and now all of a sudden I'm protected by those bits. But what you then have to think about is, you know, is it a mailbox or do I need to have actual people sitting in the Netherlands doing Dutch things, you know, buying tulips, important stuff, you know. And so what you then look, have to really look at is say, if I need to make that investment in tulips, um, you know, is it worth it? And now you start to st say the size of the deal. You know, so for example, where we use this or looked at it was in India because their nuclear liability law deviates from international best practice and people were worked up. And as part of a mitigation strategy for a client, we tried to create a layered defense. And in that layered defense was avail yourself of bits to the extent that you can. But you sit there and say, if I'm doing $20,000 of business every year, maybe it's not worth it to, to, to actually open up an office and put people there or fly people there quarterly to have a board meeting or whatever you need to do to, to clear that hurdle. And so then you start, it's a cost-benefit analysis. If you're talking about you know, building 10 nuclear power plants in India, where each of them are five, six billion dollars each, maybe more, you know, a little bit of investment in forming a Dutch entity, it's a drop in the bucket and it's worth doing. But if it's a little bit, a, a, a little bit of a bit, yeah, that's, but, but if, if it's a small deal, you may not want to make that investment in, in trying to structure things through a third country. So it's, you know, it's a cost-benefit analysis, but I think it's really just the sort of prudence 
to make sure that you're, you're arming yourself with as many protections as you can before the deal. And you know, I think it also depends on the type of the deal. If you're talking about major infrastructure projects, high profile projects, you know, if things go badly, you know, the contract doesn't really start to matter all that much because you know, the politicians in the country are gonna find a way to come after you because you, you're gonna have to be the scapegoat for the bad deal. And so you sort of say, okay, this is how it should work, but that's nice, but if it doesn't, what else can I do to protect myself outside of the country? And I think that's where availing yourself of bits is, is a good defense mechanism to have available to you, the arrow in your quiver that you structure the deal ahead of time before waiting and saying, gee, is there a bit here? Oh, no, sorry, I can't use that. You know? So that, that very helpful context. And, and so Wendy we talks about, Paul talks about thinking about things at the deal formation stage mm -hmm. as a risk mitigation tool. Do you have any other thoughts on when you, you and your clients start thinking about them yeah. and framing them? Yeah, so from a legal perspective, you're basically working back. You're looking at what jurisdiction are you investing in? What bits do they have globally? And then you're examining each one of those bits because what Paul was talking about in terms of do you have enough of a presence in the country that has a bit with the country in which you're investing, each treaty will address that differently. So they're normally called denial of benefits clauses. And if you don't have a significant enough um, connection to the jurisdiction that has the bit with the jurisdiction in which you're investing, then you can have benefits denied under that treaty. You won't be able to avail yourself of the treaty. But every single bit will treat that in a different way. I mean, you mentioned Netherlands and their bits tend to be um, light in terms of what the requirement is um, in, uh, as to how much investment you actually have to have in the Netherlands. Is it just a corporate entity? Is it something more, right? Um, so that's what you're looking at. And then in addition to that, there may be a number of bits that are potentially applicable. So you're actually sort of shopping to see which one gives the most robust protection. And that might depend on a broader definition of investment. Uh, one of the things that Michael had mentioned is what's the level of investment that you need in the host country for the bit to be applicable, for there to be an investment that you can make a claim against. So that will often depend not only on the definition of investment within the treaty, but also the forum for dispute settlement. Because um, under the ICSID convention, which is one forum for dispute settlement that might be included within the treaty, that's where that, that whole issue of having a sort of a substantial investment and making a real and lasting investment in the host jurisdiction comes into play. If, if, under, if, if um, UNCITRAL is available as a, a forum for dispute settlement, then you, you don't have that same ICSID convention definition of investment come into play. So it might be the preferable one if what you're doing in the host country is not as substantive. So those are some of the, those are just a few of the considerations and then the extent of the obligations, do they include taxation, which was the type of case you're dealing with now, do they carve that out? I mean, it's a, there's a lot of considerations. So, so Paul, do you have a, a final comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, you just mentioned tax in a different context, but you know, when you do the, these major deals, you're going to have your tax people looking at, at structuring through other countries as well. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to bring in, you know, because your tax people may say, oh, we need to go through this country and the bit may dictate you go through a different country. So you're going to have to, again, weigh all those things. The other thing that I think really just has to be emphasized and, and everybody's touched on it is, you know, the obvious, you really have to read these things carefully because, you know, some of them, for example, will have an exhaustion of local remedies clause. You know, so you can't go to the international arbitration um, provision ICSID until you've exhausted local remedies. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? You know, again, very real case in India, if you say you have to exhaust local remedies in India, we may all be dead by the time that happens. You know, and, and so how do you deal with that in a jurisdiction that may observe the rule of law, may have a, a good court system at one level, but if it takes 15 years or 20 years to hear a case before it's all said and done, that's not a meaningful remedy in a lot of cases. So, you know, you've got to start to look at, well, if I created this protection, how can I get there? What hoops do I have to jump through first? And are there ways to maybe engineer around that problem as well if you find that, 
you're not worried about the local system being corrupt or, or, or underdeveloped, but it just takes forever, which, you know, as a, as a publicly traded company, you'll be saying, I can't be con consistently reporting. I have a multi-billion dollar litigation, in, you know, in every quarterly statement that's hanging over my head for the next 15 years. That's not helpful. Right. Helpful context. So I, I couldn't resist um, having this panel without asking a few questions relating to NAFTA, just given our investment tree and mm -hmm. where we are today and, and some of the experiences um, our panel have had. And, and there's been a great deal of discussion in the media, as you know, recently with regards to NAFTA renegotiations in whole or in part, depending on what you read or when you read it. And, and in particular, uh, discussions relating to Chapter 11, which is the dispute resolution regime. And, and um, Wendy, you've had some experience um, litigating NAFTA pursuant to Chapter 11. Maybe, uh, uh, I'm not sure we need a recap, but perhaps you could briefly touch on your, your um, experience there and, and your views as to, to the extent there is a renegotiation mm -hmm. of Chapter 11. What, what's, the, what's the likely outcome in your view and, and what happens if it goes away? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Litigation under BITS is a bit different when you're dealing with a developed country context. So that's what's sort of a bit unique about NAFTA is that it's United States, Mexico, Canada. So it's not, you don't think of those countries as being as risky in terms of a location for investment as perhaps, you know, Venezuela or Argentina or countries like that. So, um, so there haven't been as many disputes under NAFTA as, um, as there may have been in, you know, under other bits and in other jurisdictions. I think there's been about 50 initiated uh, or somewhat over 50 initiated over the last um, 20, 23 years that the agreement's been in force. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a big deal to, to bring a, a dispute under, under NAFTA. Um, but once you do, I mean, I think it functions basically the same as any dispute under any bilateral investment treaty. And the one thing that I'd say that in terms of our clients, one thing we've been able to do with NAFTA is also use it as a, an advocacy tool because sometimes people don't realize that, for example, when the government of Canada adopts a new law or regulation, they um, consistency with international agreements, including bilateral investment treaties or investment agreements, is one of the reviews that they have to undertake. So it's just like review for con to make sure that the new law or regulation is um, not ultra vires or not unconstitutional, same type of thing. So you can often, if you're seeing something happening and it, it looks like it's really you know, not going to be great for a client um, and is, is pretty serious and dramatic in its potential impact, it's one of the things you can put forward to government as an advocacy piece. So I think from that perspective, it would be unfortunate to to lose that mechanism within NAFTA. I don't think that'll happen. Um, the latest I had read was that uh, the USTR representative Lighthizer had suggested that it might be an opt-in mechanism. So Canada, each of the three governments could decide whether they wanted to subject themselves to the obligation of the of the treaty or not. And his view was, well, Canada and Mexico might decide to do it because then they can show the Americans, what a great investment climate they have and continue to have. So it may just be that they'd opt in and then, you know, we might not, you never know. So I, I don't know, I, I don't know where that'll go. Um, I think uh, Canada is probably gonna look for changes to the agreement that are similar to what was done with CETA. So the, the Canada-EU um, uh, free trade agreement does have an investment chapter in it. They narrowed some of the obligations um, ostensibly to give more scope for regulation and to answer some of the, the critics in terms of taking away the sovereign rights of the countries to regulate. Um, they also put in place um, a permanent court of arbitration, which is very different because one of the big criticisms has been that you're dealing with ad hoc arbitration panels. There's no consistency in result. You could get a panel that's very favorable towards the investor. Um, you could get a panel that's not. I mean, there's just it's not a precedent-setting system. There's no arbitral awards are. We argue them as though they are precedent, but they are not binding precedent in, in any sense. So, um, so that you know that's probably something that Canada will look to. The the business community is very in favor 
of retaining the, the mechanism within the agreement. So um, for obvious reasons. And then there's usually a lot of sort of left-wing dissent and that's a, a common theme. I call it left-wing dissent. I don't know whether that's entirely fair or not, but just as a catch-all. So yeah, it's terrific and informative. Michael, I, I guess perhaps related to NAFTA, but from the UK perspective, um, well, not a party to NAFTA, obviously, in your view, has the, the, the views of uh, protectionism or renegotiation, has it had an impact on the UK or internationally, in your view? Uh, well, I guess uh, a lot of that stems from the election of Trump, and um, his election has, I think, seen a chilling of various other trade agreements that the US was negotiating, so uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Canada, I think, was also going to be a party to. Uh, the US-EU uh, trade agreement, um, and so those are, those are effectively on, well, TPP I think has been abandoned, the EU-US uh, investment treaty or, or, or treat, trade treaty has been put on ice. Um, I guess that wouldn't have affected the UK now after Brexit. Um, what the UK is going to do is, is a mystery, I think, to, to even to us Brits um, after Brexit. but. Um, by all accounts, uh, there will be a UK-US trade agreement at some point. It's not clear what sort of investment, um, uh, sorry, what sort of um, dispute resolution mechanism that will, will have, um, uh, given the hostility in the US, or but from Trump to, to, to Chapter 11 in NAFTA, it may not be your typical um, international arbitration sort of dispute resolution mechanism. We shall see. Um, but. It, it's, it's all up in the air in the mo at, at the moment and, and, and not entirely clear what will happen, but I think there's just generally the election of Trump has changed a lot of uh, what was previously accepted as being almost uh, inevitable in terms of the agreement of various trade treaties around the world. And, and on that point, Paul, we've talked about the growth and expansion of bilateral investment treaties. Is there, a, is there some element in the community uh, domestically or internationally that there's sort of a, a cooling off of bits at present for, for some, in the eyes of some? Uh, or specific to NAFTA treaties? or to, not, to not, bits? Uh, not necessarily NAFTA, just investment oh, treaties. I, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing a, a, a little, to, I want to say a little bit, but I don't, I'm trying to fight that, but um, you know, I think what you're seeing is, is some countries are pushing back on bits as, as Oh, viewing them as a weapon for foreign multinational corporations coming in to their country and you know especially when there's changeovers in governments the new government wants to do certain things they have a deal in place and a bit sitting over the top of it and, and now they take some action environmental tax whatever it may be and the multinationals are then hitting over the, hitting them over the head with the bit and they're viewing it as a bit of a sovereignty issue. And so they're, they're pushing back and saying, we don't like the way this is playing out because the, the corporations are benefiting. I think from a corporate perspective, you know, they absolutely want to see these in pr protections in place. But you know, some of the countries, I India being one of them, is, is, is taking a position that um, you know, they're not exactly thrilled with the way how all this has played out because it's, it's, it's tying their hands domestically. But the flip side is, you know, and, and I don't know that, that there's been any study done. If there is, it would be really interesting to read. But, you know, the, the presence of a bit making as a threshold issue to doing a deal that if the bit goes away, that corporation wouldn't have done the deal. And that's sort of weighing the costs and benefits. You know, it's easy for the... the the host countries say, I don't like these results, but if you pull the bit and then people don't want to do business in the country, they're not going to like that result either. So it, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out because the, you know, the multinationals are clearly going to want to see the bits in place. Yeah, I would have thought the, the I could see the tension there with, with some jurisdictions wanting to, to um, um, keep things domestically, but on the other hand, you have them entering into the bits, and so as long as they're in force, I take it the investors can have some comfort in that. Perhaps one final question to comment with, or to canvas with the panel. From a practical perspective, we've, we've sort of talked about what they are. We've given some real live examples of what's going on with NAFTA. 
What recommendations would you have for parties that are structuring transactions now, tangible recommendations with a view to taking advantage or being live to, to the potential of investment treaties? You want to um, crack at that, Michael? Yeah. Um, well, I would uh, first highly recommend the note that we've prepared on, on, on exactly on this, <laughs> which um, if, if you're interested, you can come and ask me. I'll, I'll, I've got copies with me on structuring investments uh, to get protection from, from uh, investment treaties, and we're ha very happy to circulate that. And after having read that, obviously, get good advice from someone like from me or <laughs> Wendy or <laughs> Paul. Um, but all joking aside, I guess um, it is something to think about, as, as we've talked about at the outset of the transaction. Uh, I would hasten to add that it's not necessarily too late. If there's anyone sitting out there thinking, oh no, we, we, forgot, to, we forgot to do this when we were doing a particular deal, it might not be too late to restructure your transaction if you are worried about the potential uh, risk that you're facing in a particular foreign country. Um, tribunals have generally found that um, uh, restructuring to get benefit from investment protection agreements after a dispute has arisen is impermissible, but it is perfectly a perfectly legitimate thing to do if you do it before there is a scope of a dispute arising on the horizon. Um, so so that's, that's one thing to mention. But the, the things to look out for are what is the scope of the protection of the treaty? How wide is the protection? What, what is carved out? What doesn't get protection? What sort of um, transactions may not be protected by a treaty? Does the treaty specify a level or measure of compensation that you might get if you're uh, investment is expropriated and what is it and how does that compare to other treaties? Um, does the treaty have various provisions such as ones we've discussed uh, like fork in the road provisions, umbrella clauses um, and as, as Paul alluded to also consider and get tax people involved in, in, the, dis in the discussion because there are huge potential tax implications of any structure that you, you, you might implement in order to get investment treaty protection. Terrific. So we've heard about thinking about investment treaties from the context of the, at the investment, uh, at, at the deal formation stage, <coughs> thinking about them as a risk mitigation tool, being aware, reviewing them carefully, being aware of any carve outs. And those are the things that we're encouraging um, our clients to think about, all with a view of thinking about this early on so that when you, if you do end up in a dispute, you, you have some clarity as to what the landscape's gonna be. I want to uh, thank my panel for having come here and traveled here. All of them have traveled to be here today and, and um, they're all experts in their field. And uh, thank you very much for coming. And, uh, before we close off, well, I'll, I'll take a few questions if we've got time and then, my, and then and Bob Armstrong's gonna come up and have a few co concluding remarks. But while the panel's here, do we have any questions for them? Yes, sir. Can you just give a brief So I'm not sure any of us know enough specifically about patent law to comment on yeah. the patent laws of those specific regimes. I mean, from a general perspective, you know, as I was saying, we did a case for Eli Lilly that involved patent rights. So generally speaking, under a bilateral, bi bilateral yeah. investment treaty, that is a form of right that has protection. Um, it does get a bit complicated because in many cases, it's the courts that adjudicate patent rights, so it'll be the domestic court in Russia or the domestic court in China that adjudicates patent rights, and it, it may be more difficult to challenge um, the decision of a court under an investment treaty versus uh, government action. So, but you know, there may be a circumstance where the government simply doesn't follow its own patent rules or um, removes a patent after the fact or by administrative procedure. I mean, that's, that's possible too. Um, but there's no, I mean, there's no, I see you have to look at our specific, we have a bilateral investment treaty with China, and I'm sure it does cover intangible property rights, so it may, you know, confer a level of protection. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a different analysis than any other form of investment with those caveats that sometimes you're dealing with courts versus the, the administrative or executive arm of the government. Mm -hmm. 
One, one other thing to mention with Chinese BITs that I, I'm not sure if all of them, but a lot of them don't provide for um, international arbitration as a means of dispute resolution under the treaty because the, the Chinese don't want to surrender what they see as sovereign issues to uh, a panel of arbitrators. But that's something that, that depends on each particular treaty and needs checking in, in, in each case. I think the Canadian one does. does it? Yeah, I think it does. It's pretty, it's pretty similar to most of the foreign investment protection agreements we've negotiated. So. How about the Russian Can't specific. help you, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we have a bit with Russia. We have a, a wonderful office in Moscow. We can certainly yeah, connect definitely. you with, with our colleagues there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. especially in IP, they win like ridiculous amount of awards every year. So, yeah. you know, happy to, to connect you with the folks there. Maybe the largest office in, of, a, of a Western based law firm is in Moscow, of our firm. Yeah. Any other questions? Bob, do you want to come up? Okay, well, look, it's, uh, uh, this is the first time we've, we've hosted this session. We'll do it again. And um, uh, I think all three panels were informative. We had uh, people travel here. I, I know I certainly enjoyed it and learned a great deal. Um, and it was terrific for them to come listen to your questions. Thank you all for coming. It was our pleasure to have hosted you this morning. And we hope to keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.